on the morning of June 6, 1944. 132,000 Allied soldiers landed on the northern coast of France. 21,000 of those brave and young soldiers were from the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, who landed on Juneau Beach. Their main objective was to capture the Carpiquet airfield and reach the Khan Bayou railway line by nightfall. The battle that ensued saw the loss of 340 Canadians and 540 more wounded. And despite the losses, the Canadians were able to complete their objectives. By the time all Anglo-Canadian operations were halted at 2100 hours that night, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division managed to push the farthest inland compared to any other landing force on D-Day. In remembrance of the brave and valorous Canadian troops, we will be taking a look at King and Country's DD-113, 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, attack. The set is a part of the D-Day 44 Canadians collection. It was released in July of 2009 and was retired in August of 2012. The set comes with two one ratio 30 figurines, a Canadian infantry sergeant holding the Sten submachine gun and a Canadian rifleman equipped with the Lee Enfield No. 4 rifle. Now before we start this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe and allow notifications to stay updated for future content. With that being said, let's begin. The figurines stand at approximately 6 cm tall or around 2.5 inches, which is the standard height for King & Country's lineup. Both of them are wearing the Canadian variant of the number no. 5 battle dress uniform, commonly but incorrectly referred to as the pattern 1937 battle dress. Unbeknownst to many, the Canadian Expeditionary Forces battle dress uniform had a more greenish shade of khaki than the British variant, which is a more brownish on green khaki. The insignia that can be seen on both shoulders of the figurines are the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, marked with a rectangular French grey patch, which is visible here. As for the arch or tab on top of the division patch, it belongs to the unit's individual regiment. I can't quite make out what it says, but based on the first wave of troops that landed on Juno, I would assume that they are either the North Shore Regiment, Queen's Own Rifles, Regina Rifles, or the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. But if you have an idea of what the tab might be, do leave a comment down below. The webbing gear used by these two figurines is the Pattern 37 webbing. On the front, you can see the P37 basic pouch, which was used to store the user's ammunition. Soldiers would typically fill them with grenades and clips or magazines of their primary weapons. In the case of the Bren gun assistance, they would also carry extra pouches to store spare magazines for the Bren. On the back, you can see that they have the Pattern 37 haversack equipped. The poncho was folded so as to cushion the back, and it is also visible under the flap. Below the haversack and looped into the P37 belt, we can see the Pattern 37 entrenching tool. It consists of a spade used for digging defensive fighting positions and sometimes even for close quarter combat. Slung onto the right side of the E-tool is the Pattern 37 canteen and pouch. It comes with its own sling, but it would often still be attached to the main webbing system worn by the soldiers. On the other side, there is a Mark II lightweight gas mask pouch. Much like their American counterparts, British and Commonwealth forces had the fear that the Nazis would use gas attacks in retaliation, and due to that, all the soldiers rushing the beaches of gold, Juno, and sword carried these along with them. On a side note, did you know that the Anglo-Canadian beachheads on D-Day were named after species of fish? There's goat for goatfish, sword for swordfish, and well, Juno for jellyfish. Juno Beach was initially supposed to be named Jelly Beach, but then British Prime Minister Winston Churchill felt that it was a tad inappropriate and I quote, disapproved of the name Jelly for a beach on which so many men might die. And hence the name was changed to Juno. Back to the figurines. Underneath that pouch, you may notice a black looking stick poking out. I'm not 100% sure, but it looks to be the scabbard of the Mark II bayonet. If I'm wrong, do correct me down in the comments below. The footwear that is adorned are the British Ammunition Boots, also known as Boots Ankle General Service or BGS. Wrapped on top of that are the P37 Web Anklets or Gaiters, which were used to keep dirt, insects and other foreign objects from entering the soldiers' boots. Much like the Americans, British and Commonwealth forces utilized canvas anklets as they wished to conserve leather to produce more boots as well as jerkin for cold weather. Even the British Paris did not have specialized jump boots like their American counterparts. As for the helmets worn by these figures, 
It is the Mark II Brody helmet that is covered with a net and scrim for the purposes of camouflaging and disrupting the shape of the helmet. Now moving on to the differences of these two figurines. The sergeant has three downwards pointing chevrons on both sides of his shoulders, signifying his rank. The ranks used by the Canadian Army during World War II were usually issued by the British, much like most of the other equipment used by them. On his back, he is equipped with a British Army pickaxe, which is often used when encountering large rocks when building slit trenches and bunker positions. On top of his haversack, he has what I believe to be a sleeping mat or bag. The last piece of equipment, and perhaps the most essential, is his stand gun, which was the most used submachine gun in the British and Commonwealth forces during World War II. It was typically carried by section or platoon commanders so that they may suppress the enemy while the riflemen advance to flank and eliminate their targets. As for the rifleman, instead of a pickaxe, he is equipped with a British General Service shovel, which was to go hand in hand with the pickaxe and P37E tools to make digging into large entrenchments easier. As his role suggests, he is a rifleman, and hence he is equipped with the Lee Enfield Mark IV rifle, which was the most used rifle in the British and Commonwealth forces during the last Great War. These two figurines are truly well detailed, and despite them being released well over 10 years ago, the paint and quality still holds up until today. King and Country always prides themselves in recreating history through the use of miniatures. This duo is really accurate and portrays the brave Canadian soldiers exceptionally well. I think these would make a fine addition to any collection or diorama depicting the Canadian forces on the Western European front. Even though it has been discontinued, you can always look them up on eBay or any resale sites. Some of King & Country's official distributors may have a few leftovers in their storage or may be able to backorder them. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it informative. And if you did, please like and subscribe, and I'll do my best to deliver more of such content. Thank you for watching, and happy collecting.